All right, I just want to say thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. It's a really busy time, so close to Christmas. Uh, but hopefully you can find some lovely Christmas gifts here today, either here or <laughs> downstairs um, in this great bookshop, um, Better Red Than Dead, in Newtown. So we're here to celebrate the launch of the book, uh, Dream of Courage, Facing Fear Head On. It's the third book in the trilogy, uh, the Skullduggery trilogy, which Paul has written, uh, which is about the Rushworth family, set in 1600s in New York. So a lot of people say that behind every successful man, there is a great woman. <laughs> but I would actually like to commend Paul because he's worked so hard on his writing. Uh, he's worked really, he works really hard on the research that he does. Um, and he works incredibly hard on marketing, as all of you that are on Facebook would know. So the only things I really do is I keep the fridge stocked with beer. Um, I'll read the uh, manuscripts for him. So I do a little bit of, you know, first draft. Sometimes I do second draft. Sometimes the third draft. Um, earlier this year, he handed me what was the final draft and asked me if I could have a, have a read of that. Um, which I did. It took me about three weeks. We had a red pen and I went over it with a you know, fine tooth comb and just really you know, got to the end and said, okay, well, we need to have a bit of feedback about this book. And we had a very animated discussion and I told him where I thought the chapters might not have ended in the right place and this character needed a bit more development. And, and, uh, and I said, in the ending, I said, I don't know about that ending. <laughs> anyway, and he goes, that's not how the book ends. And he goes, he looks at my manuscript and he goes, oh, no, that's old. He goes, I've rewritten the book since this one. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's now 200 pages long and the, and the ending's completely different. <laughs> I'm like, that's three weeks of my life. I'll never get back very much. you your your special Yeah, no, luckily, luckily I was finished, so yeah, all good. But anyway, I think um, now it's actually been beautifully edited by Shoreline Publishing and, um, and now published. So I still don't know the ending, so I will have to read the book. Thank you very much for the free copy. Uh, and uh, no spoilers, I think uh, the, we're about to have a, a conversation, um, a, an interview by Neil Lithgow here. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for coming, Neil. So Neil uh, is a, a voiceover artist and uh, he's conducted many, many interviews. Uh, Paul and I, Paul and Neil met for the first time uh, a couple of years ago now, I think, when Neil interviewed Paul on Community Radio, one of his previous books. So without further ado, I'm going to leave it to my husband, Paul Rushworth Brown, the author, uh, to be interviewed by Neil Lithgow. Thank you. Very much. Thanks, Hello, Paul. Hi, Neil. How are you? It's been a Good. long time. It's been a uh, been a big day with setup, but Whew, we're here. I know we're here to talk about your third book. I've talked to you, of course, about your first book, and you mm. said you'd written another two more. Mm. We're here talking about your third book. Can you believe that? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, because um, I uh, I knew that there was more to come after writing the first. Um, I was I was more uh, engaged in the second. And the third one, um, even though it took two years to do, um, I actually think it um, it was a lot easier than the, than, than the first one to write. It just came, just the story just came. So, what inspired you to write *Dream of Courage*, of facing fear head on? Um, I mean, that time, that beginning of the 1700s, it was such a such an a mate, just a crazy time in in uh, in Britain. Um, you know, I mean, it was it was uh, 50, 50 years. Um, uh, since the, the English Civil War, um, there was still sort of like lack of food. The wool industry in Britain was sort of like uh, starting to uh, wind down a little bit. Um, but pe th then came the middleman, you know, and they were sort of like making you know hu huge amounts of money, sort of like taking wool from farmers and and uh, basically selling it on the black market. There was pirates, um, and, and there, there was a lot of pirates actually around Yorkshire where it's at. Okay. Um, and the Haven and, and that so um, just that there was highwaymen um, you know just that sort of like uh, that period was just a very very um, ex exciting well I, I think it was exciting um, the people were held up by the highwaymen probably no did, probably but, not yeah. <laughs> um, why did you pick that particular area then um, well that's where my family comes from 
Okay. Um, many years ago, I did a uh, family history and, and traced my uh, furthest away ancestor back to Yorkshire um, in 1590. And uh, I suppose the, the way the original book came about was because I wanted to find out, who, you know, how did this man live? And then autom automatically, oh, I won't say automatically, I turned it into a whodunit. Mm -hmm. Right, and then um, uh, Red Winter Journey was uh, in the, the second book in, this, in, in, the, in the trilogy was bas basically the next generation. And then I thought, well, I didn't want to do a, a, another generation, so I just sort of like went off on a tangent a little bit. And even though Robert and John Rushworth, um, I, I suppose, are part of my fictional family, um, it's, it's a very, very different book than the other two. Is it based on real things that you found out about them? No. No, no, so, so all, all, all figments of my imagination. Okay. You've done some extensive research for all of this as yeah. well, which I know you love doing, but you've spent quite a bit of time over there too. Are there, was there a lot of people locally that helped you with that? When, uh, well, I had to write a work to Keithley Library and they were really, really helpful and they actually found a document where with my great grandfather times 10, his name on a, on a manor court roll. Wow. And um, so that was sort of like the, the, the start of, you know, this, this trilogy, I, I suppose. But it's not, a, it's not a family history. It's more of like an adventure, uh, mystery, romance, um, all, all set in the, uh, in, you know, the 16th and 17th hundreds. So where did the title come from? What's with facing fear that's important to you? I've got to be careful with that one because the, the, the title is, is a very poignant point. And um, I... I can't say too much about it because it would give something away in, in the novel. Of course. All right, so, um, <laughs> they all you, say that. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to read the novel to find out. <laughs> okay. Um, when you're writing a book, what's your creative process? Is it the, and is it always the same? It's always the same because there's, there's not much of a process. I just start writing. And um, because, I, I, because I don't plan anything, it makes it very, very easy to move things around and have a little t uh, twist there, a little twist here. And um, so it just sort of like, I suppose, um, it, build, it, builds, it, it allows me to build the intensity and build the mystery as I go along. And nothing's, nothing's in stone. I mean, I've written something in sort of like the, the second chapter. And then as I get towards the end of the book, I say, oh, hold on a minute, I'll put that there because it will be a good twist to the novel. So somewhere in your house, is there a storyboard that you keep moving no, things no, no. around on? Or? No, it's all up here. All, up, all in yeah. there. No, I mean, I'm a teacher, I'm a PE teacher. And people say, people say, where does it come from? And I say, I don't know, it just comes. You just, you just start writing. Do you ever get writer's block? The Sometimes. famous, the dreaded writer's um, block? Not very often. Okay, but, um, how do you work through that? Oh, usually sort of like uh, walking down the street with, with my wife and my dog, and all of a sudden it comes. So and you, it just magically goes. That's yep. <laughs> when I first interviewed you about two and a half years ago, you were saying that your family history inspired all of that. Uh, so does that mean that uh, what are their names? Robert and John Rushworth. Are they? How did you come up with those particular characters for this book, as opposed to the others? The names. Well, and and what their characters okay. are. Okay. Uh, well, the names actually are um, John and Robert. I had uh, twin uncles. When I was very young, and uh, and uh, so I used their first name, but um, their characters are um, very uh, very different. They're twins, obviously, and uh, Robert um, is very very different to, to John, as as you'll find out. And um, uh, Robert gets himself in a bit of trouble, and um, that's a very very good uh, sequence in the novel. Your main bad guy, Jacob Wilding, is Ooh, he? Yeah. Um, is he based on anyone you know? Well, I hope not. <laughs> because um, he, he's, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's not a very nice man. Okay. Uh, there's also romance in this novel. And, yeah, you have, and you have put some in your, your previous ones as well. Uh, what do you draw on when you're writing the romantic parts of your novel? Oh, of course, previous history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to look at Claire there. Is there? Did you recognise anything in there? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a certain number of shades in there. It's not quite that. No, uh, not that it's very. It's it's a nice romantic story. Okay. 
Uh, do you plan on going back over to the Yorkshire area and oh, continuing definitely. to do research and doing some more? Yeah, definitely. We're supposed to be going next year. Okay. What do you What do you hope that readers will get out of this? Mm. I, I'd like them to look. Um, not much has been written by peasants in the 17th and 18th centuries, and if you uh, look at most of the books, are all about the lords and the ladies, um, and I believe these these peasants that, that lived back, you know, clodhoppers they call them by the rich people. Mm -hmm. um, I think they deserve a voice. Yeah. And when I write my novels, I write it the way it was, right? So I mean, they say that eighty-five percent of uh, you know Westerners um, actually have ancestors from you know Britain and Ireland and, and uh, Scotland. So I wanted to firstly to, to make it extremely accurate, right? Tell it the way it was. Um, and I want people to feel like when they read it, they're stepping back in time. Okay. And, and, and there's some eye-opening things in there. You know, oh my God, is that what my answer is? That, is that how they lived? Did they live with a cow stuck in the corner of the, the, the cottage? You know, <laughs> did they, um, you know, they, they couldn't boil, they couldn't drink water because it was too filthy. And um, just having a very, very good, good look at how our ancestors lived back in those, those times. So how did you get that sort of detail about what they wore, what they ate? Because you've got all of that in there. Yeah, just, just lots and lots and lots of research. And um, I, I actually used uh, historical databases that, you know, that with papers written by um, PhD um, people. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's very, very accurately portrayed. For people that haven't read your t previous two books, is this a continuation or can you read this as a standalone? Is it one of those books or movies where you go, oh God, I've got to read the other two first? No, or can, can it be read as a standalone? No, actually all of them can. Okay. All right, so, I mean, the way I wrote it was that you could, you could uh, read Skullduggery or you could read Rent Red, Red Winter Journey or Dream of Courage um, as a trilogy or individual. When I first interviewed you nearly three years ago, I said, were you planning any more? And you, you said at the time you were going to write 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that still yeah, a plan? That's, that's Is that still a, a dream that you have? Yeah, that's still on. There's plenty more adventures. I guess yeah. you've, you've still got another, what, four, three or 400 years <laughs> that you can yeah, fill yeah. in between yeah. now and then. Yeah. So without giving anything away and this, uh, would some of these survive to see another book? Or would you pick a completely different time oh, again? I've actually started the, the fourth one. So I've come away from the trilogy. Um, and the f I, wanted to, so I wanted to add a little bit of Australiana. So my fourth book is called um, Odyssey in the Outback. And it's actually about, it's a story of a young man that comes from Yorkshire back in the 50s as a 10 pound pom pom. Okay. And wow. uh, when, he, uh, when he arrives, they send him out to a, a sheep station out in the, in the Victorian outback. And sort of like talks about you know his dealings with with the Aboriginal people and and that, that type of thing. Okay, in back to this particular book, uh, is there any of you in one particular character? Sometimes writers sort of have this character that very much resembles them. It might not be the main one, but is there a Paul Rushworth Brown sort of character hiding in there that you identify with? Um, I'd hate to say Jacob Walden. <laughs> <laughs> you just told me how horrible he was. <laughs> he is. Um, if, if, he's, if, if, uh, if there's a dark side of my, my personality, it'd be Jacob Walden. If there's, <laughs> if, if, if there's a light side of my personality, it'd be uh, Robert Rushworth. Okay, so there are, there's little bits of you yeah, in all of the yeah, characters. Yeah. So hopefully not too much of, uh, of Jacob yeah. Walding in there. <laughs> um, are there any plans to, to are there, have there been any offers from Hollywood yet? I guess that's where we're coming with I'm this. I'm waiting for HBO. Still waiting for the, still, uh, waiting, for still HBO. waiting for the series yep. uh, coming but up. Things that have uh, come Would it be something you entertain though, seriously, oh, if someone asked you? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, net, I mean, the, the difference is since the last time I met you, I've got an agent over in the US now. Okay. Um, and I've got sponsors um, that um, I deal with quite regularly. So, um, the ad for Dream of Courage is actually playing um, on at Times Square 
in wow. New York City uh, tomorrow morning, our time. You're not going to fly over there to no, have no, a, no, no. get a photo, get a selfie <laughs> with your, your thing up there. I'll watch it, I'll watch it on that. When you wrote, for, wrote Skullduggery first, how easy or difficult was it to get a publisher to, to actually publish it? Because I, I know writers often struggle with that, yeah, especially uh, first time writers. Yeah, it's very difficult, very difficult. And um, we were both extremely happy when um, Shoreline decided to take it on. Um, and originally I self published. And, I <laughs> and uh, when, I, uh, when Shoreline took it on, I rewrote. It, it became uh, 200 pages longer, developed the characters a little bit more. Um, and uh, became a seller. Um, my self-published self-published copy was terrible. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I look I look back and read some bits of it now, and I've I've tried to sort of like uh, slowly start to to um, dissipate them out of the house. So <laughs> Well, and that was actually another question I had. If you could go back and talk to Paul Rushworth Brown at that point in time, knowing what you know now, mm. what advice would you give him? Be more patient. Yeah. Be more patient because early on, um, one, of, one of the, the issues I had, I just wanted to write it, edit it, and get it out there. And that's not what, not the way to write a book. I mean, this take this is this is like two years of my life right here. This uh, dream of courage, and um, that's one one thing that I've learned. Um, over the last sort of like uh, five years is just to be patient with my writing and uh, be patient with the editing process and don't be afraid to sort of like go back and change, change it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sometimes uh, a change is, is usually for the better. Yeah. Do you get uh, feedback from readers and, and fans yeah. or, or comments and, or that's not historically correct? I, I have, <laughs> I do. And um, I, I mean, when I wrote um, Skullduggery, right, this person had actually, um, a actually slammed me. The first review I ever, ever got, I got absolutely slammed. And I admit it wasn't sort of probably the best edit, right? Um, the story was there and obviously the story grew and became 200 pages longer. Um, but th this particular person absolutely slammed me. Anyway, I did some research on who she was. And the last book she'd re reviewed on Goodreads was a Ukrainian tractors. <laughs> How to keep, uh, and she gave it five stars. <laughs> so maybe it just wasn't in her area of no. interest, perhaps. No. And I, I think, I mean, you know, God, I, I get, um, you know, probably th th two, three times a day, I get my like, marketers trying to contact me saying, look, we can, we can market your book, blah, 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 blah. And I never do, I just, just ignore them. But I th sometimes think that because I ignore them, they, um, not all of them, but a couple of them that maybe tend to get a little bit nasty. And so at what point as a writer do you say, okay, I need to do a second edition or a third edition? Um, How important does something have to be or a change have to um, be? Well, definitely Skullduggery. Um, yeah, I know you've noticed yeah. that, yeah, second edition yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Red Winter Journey is is good. I think this this is probably the best out of the three. Well, not this one, but the, the dream, <laughs> this one. This one, this dream one. of Courage. <laughs> Is the best out of the three. I think it's uh, more di more dynamic. I think it's um, it, it has uh, a number of different, or um, well not a number, but it's got two or three stories uh, happening in in the story, um, and uh, the twists and turns, and uh, people never see them. The ending you'd never never pick. So I think um, I'm I'm pretty proud of this one. <laughs> My baby. <laughs> At what point, when you write the ending, how do you know when your book is finished, when it's done? Because um, well, there'd be a temptation to keep writing. Yeah, well, the interesting thing is, as Claire mentioned before, she read the book and she read out the, the ending and she said, oh, she, we wanted to change that. I said, no, that's not the ending anymore. Right, so um, I got an idea for the ending, which, which was better than the, the, than the current ending, and that added to like another 200 pages to the book. Wow. So you don't because then I had to go back and yeah. change things. Yeah, so you don't always have the ending in mind. No. So you will, yes, which... No. Yeah, no. often happens. Yeah. And as I say, I don't plan anything. So I think people, authors that plan, I think they, um, you know, they plan, it, plan it all out on, on the storyboards and that type of thing. No, I don't do that. And same with word limits then. You'll just keep writing keep until writing. you feel like the story yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is done and has, has said what it has yeah. to say. Somebody said, you know, geez, that book's quite thick. 
It's a lot thicker than the other two. I said, yeah. <laughs> and the next one then, that could be bigger, smaller? I think this is pushing it. <laughs> I think, okay. I think four, yeah. heading towards 400, I think it's 400, and, uh, heading towards 450 pages. So it's, um, a, it's, a, it's, it's yeah. one for the hardcore readers, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think. We're getting some nods from the audience yeah. here. But, so. but as I said, um, it's just been reviewed. 499. Oh, just four, four oh, right. <laughs> okay, so um, the historical fiction company just reviewed it, gave it an editorial review. And uh, that's like a major historical fiction, you know, they, they, uh, they do reviews, they do uh, publishing only for ho historical fiction. They gave it 9 out of 10, 10, which I thought was pretty good. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, did we have any questions from our audience members here that they wanted to ask Paul? Does it go on Kindle? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's on Kindle. Is that a big job? Is that a bit of a drama? No, uh, publisher handles all that. Uh, so Do you have to change things around? Or? No, no. Uh, they, they, uh, it's on Kindle, it's on Kobo, it's on, you know, I mean, it's on Smashwords. Um, it's, it's on ev every single uh, platform that you can, um, you can think of and be on there. Except Audible. A except Audible. I was going to ask about audio books. Yeah, that's the next step. The next step, okay. Yeah, it's so expensive, though. Yeah. Expensive for you. Yeah. Oh, with my voice, the way I stutter, <laughs> it'd take two days to read the book, or two, two months. If only he knew a good voiceover artist. <laughs> 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 okay, we can work on that. <laughs> Any other questions from our audience? Yeah. Um, when you're writing, do you consume any other books or do you just shut yourself off so you don't get... No, nah, I've always said I'm, I don't read. I mean, because I'm a teacher, I do a lot of reading yeah, work. Of so from a, um, from a sort of like um, in entertainment point of view, I don't read. Mm -hmm. The only books I read are mine. <laughs> That's good advertising. <laughs> I say the same with podcasts too. People go, do you listen to this podcast? I went, no, I only do, I do mine. I don't do anyone else's. <laughs> yes, another question. You two look like you have a beautiful relationship. I'm just curious, what's it like, Claire, having to critique? And uh, what's the dynamic there when things don't go quickly? Oh, look, pretty good, actually. I, I, mean, I do read a lot, and I love reading, and I read all different genres of books. Um, so I think I always keep my, con uh, it's not criticism, I suppose it's constructive. I say, oh, I think if I was reading this book, I, would, oh, I think I would enjoy it if it was like this. And, and I think Paul's pretty good. He, he'll usually push back on me a, a few times about bits and pieces. And at the end of the day, it's his book to be, um, so, that, so that's fine. But essentially, a lot of the times you've taken on some things and yeah. actually said, oh, that's actually a really good idea. And, so yeah, I think um, I think it works quite well. I really enjoy doing it. You know, it's um, uh, because I enjoy reading. But also, I have learned so much about that time period in Yorkshire that I didn't know about about yeah the cows that live in the house. <laughs> 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 like, it's like I go, really? He says really. So yeah, I, I, I enjoy it. It's good. I take a lot of uh, feedback from the public as well, and uh, I always um, I, I give you an example in. Um, uh, Red Winter Journey. Um, obviously, it was wartime. Even though it's not really a war story, it's more a story more about the, a father's love for his son. And um, there's a there's a part in the in the novel where there's a rape scene, and I was really hesitant to put it in there. So what I did was I actually um, went to my fans on Facebook and said, "Look, I'm thinking about putting this in in, in the story. Um, this is the context." This is the the the, the, uh, the passage. Can you read it and, and uh, tell me what what you think? And um, they came back and said, "No, nah, it's fine." So it's not it, it's it's a rape scene, but it's not really a uh, it's not a gory rape scene. I know when you were uh, the first time I talked to you too. You said when you were writing, you would just lock yourself in a room for ages. And uh, I think Claire, you went and got some more qualifications. You went and did some study. And uh, <laughs> so, do you have a doctorate now? Walsh, two and a half years of study. Always upstairs. I was downstairs. 
And how are the kids? Uh, you've got um, children. They're all, they're all away. They're okay. all, they live up in Queensland. Okay, but what do they what do they think about their father being an author? Um, oh, when I first started, they um, they said, "Oh yeah, Dad, you'll probably start write ten pages and then give it away." <laughs> and uh, so my my youngest, Haley, um, she's right into it. She loves it. She's uh, she said, "Oh, Dad, send me a signed book." And I said, "No freebies this time." <laughs> 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 so she bought it. Oh, wow! <laughs> and actually, one of the characters is based on based on her. Ah, okay. So um, yeah. Good. So, Paul, how effective is Facebook and Instagram to sell? Uh, abs- absolutely useless. Useless. <laughs> yeah. <it's>, um, <laughs> social media is not about we'll being able to <laughs> be, being able to sell books. It's about being able to get your name out there. Mm-hmm. Right. It's about um, sort of like uh, I suppose building your brand. Your brand. So, social media builds a brand, and things like this sell books. Any other questions from the uh, wonderful audience that we have? No? Okay. I just one, one more. Your inspiration just come in the daytime better or now? When do you find that the flow is... Um, usually in the morning. In the morning? Yeah, but um, I'll tend to, tend to write whenever I've got some free time. Right. But I multitask. Okay. So I might have... I've got three screens at home. So I'll have the book on one. I have one research, and then I have a game of chess going on the other. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, sorry, or, or else I'd be writing, you know, continually, not doing anything else. But you've been working full time and self-time. Yeah. Yeah. So how does the morning fit? You get up. Um, no, no. Usually on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Okay. Yeah. And then obviously, uh, being a teacher, we get uh, time in lieu of holidays <laughs> for all the marking <laughs> time that we do. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Claire has been very, very busy <laughs> <laughs> doing her um, PhD. <laughs> yeah. 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 What about Frida? What does she think of you just that screen all the time? Um, she's pretty supportive. Yeah, she 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 still comes and brings me the sock to to play with. And, and do you? Yeah. 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 Keeps it normal. Yeah. Keeps it normal. Yeah. I was hoping that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, that was really weird. It was a bit. Anything else from the crowd? Okay. I'd like to thank you for coming um, that's, down that's to fine. Queensland to, <laughs> to do it. And, uh, I didn't quite come that far. Yeah. And uh, as Claire said, thank you very much for, for coming today. It's, um, it's a really special day for me and um, I really pre- appreciate your time and effort so, so close to Christmas. And of course, I'd like, love to thank my beautiful wife for all her support. <laughs> and I also need to um, mention my sponsors. <laughs> Just quickly, <laughs> and so meet the author. Most of these are over in the U.S. So meet meet the author is over in the U.S. By the author is sort of like um, over in the U.S. Okay, the so Witty Writer Show is um, is once again over in the U.S. Um, Northern Life is a magazine um, over in uh, over in Yorkshire, um, and the Neil Halley Show. Um, they're involved with my s- sponsor, uh, Paul Hollis. He's actually an author, of him, author himself. Um, and then the four novels down the bottom, uh, Julian Wells, um, Lauren Ashley, um, they are um, sponsors as well. And all authors, of course. Okay. And so thank you very much for coming. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs>